Hello everybody, this is Lizard Gaming. I'm here to do a Halloween special. This actually took place in 2019, literally a year ago, and it was a Halloween horror story D&D one-shot. Five players all at five level, good friends of mine, and I thought it'd be a fun idea to do that and be their DM. Okay, if we're gonna have to start off our video, we'd have to start off with our characters first. Well, Taylor started off with a Bone Devil Tiefling Cleric. And, well, that's not really ironic. Unlike his last character. Johnny actually had a Rogue Paladin Halfling. And, you'll see a, you'll see some connections here. Ed had an Aracrocra Paladin Monk, who's just, you know... <laughs> Justin had a Kenku Paladin fighter, and Caleb had just a straight orc paladin. Yeah, this is mid maxing at its finest. <laughs> yeah, I'm not kidding you. They they when I told them they were gonna die in this series, they really they really amped up their game. Our quest begins with our characters in the town of Holland, where they go to the Adventurers Guild and uh, look out for a quest. No one's actually at the Adventurers Guild except for most of the employees there that give out the quests. Two quests are actually on the billboard, but one of them has been pinned by what is assumed to be the entirety of the guild and many other you know, Fighters Guild, Mages, and Knights Guilds, and whatnot, pin this one quest requesting for a Tarask to be slayed. But, as the DM, I try nudging him away from that to their actual quest that they're supposed to do. A cult quest that has not even been touched. So, their job is to go figure out this assumed cult in a place called Lodervik northeast of their uh, current town by at least a week's travel across a mountain range to what is assumably a large lake town that is uh, low in population but it's been having some trouble. So that's how I kind of got this crew going to their little Halloween trip for this one-off. So, our party decided to gather up supplies and prepare for their weeks-long travel to the town. They had no in particular encounters all along their trip, just enjoying farmlands and forests and uh, making their way through rocky cliffs and worn roads throughout the mountain range. Once they got to the other side of the mountain range, they did see the beautiful Great Lake and barely making visible of the lake town that is uh, Lodervik. They noticed a good clearing southeast, but that leads to the Wyrm Sea, but that's not important. Once they make their way down to Lodervik, they were greeted with open arms and, well, smiles knowing that there are saviors to come and help. They were told that there are two, if maybe more, investigation sites that do help on this journey. One of them being the the docks, a specific part of the docks that has had suspicious activity. And considering this is a lake town, they need these docks for fishing and trade, just as much as being a inland town, they still need to hunt as well. But fishing is their most known trade, and well, trading across lakes is good various other towns on the lake. The manor is their second known cult activity spot. This is known due to the fact it is burnt from the main hall, as if a summoning took place and destroyed good 90% of the, the uh, manor. Nobles lived here, but no one knows if they made it out or they were a part of the cult. No bodies were found, and this is what started the idea of cult activity. So, our players actually decided that it was best to go to the docks to investigate first, because a lot of them were telling me that they already played Call of Cthulhu and did not want to go near the mansion. I hadn't 
played or watched any uh, Call of Cthulhu yet until after the campaign, and I understood why they were uh, freaking out about the mansion. When they went to the docks, they actually had to look through some of the boathouses and sniff around uh, areas that they really shouldn't. But this is an investigation. They had to uh, snoop around. So, what they did find was five cloaks of varying color and a medallion of Thurz... No, 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 it was Cardun. Cardun, the Baylor Prince of Baylors and Fire. They were curious now that they have full confirmation that a cult has been around in the docks uh, doing unknown acts. So, they had to one investigation area cleared. Next location they had to make to make their way to was the manor, the Burnt Manor. From what they have been told is only two parts of the building have been saved. A storage room that was turned into an art gallery and a painting station for one of the nobles' daughters and the pantry, both furthest east and furthest west of the manor. Both survived because of said summoning ritual took center part of the manor. They avoided the painting gallery at all costs from literally past experiences from a video game and went straight to the pantry. They notice that it's basically a standard pantry except with a uh, hatch hidden underneath a rug and once they entered through that they have found some more occult based symbols and whatnot more robes some ritual weaponry and some other unknown uh, iconography uh, a few of them have been able to uh, use knowledge religion to find out uh, cults of uh, Shabnegaroth, Cthulhu, and all these other cults of chaotic evil or neutral evil nature. And once they got that out of the way and still not finding any leads on where these could be, they had one location left, the art gallery. <clears throat> and they were really hesitant on even wanting to open the door. Once they opened the door, they were greeted with a very uh, menacing painting of a devil-like figure standing, well not really standing, just the face, like a painting of a bust or a painting of a face, burning and moving as it just stares into their general direction. It's not alive or anything, it just unnaturally feels alive. But what they can tell from the paintings that, uh, the paint that they, uh, made this painting is it's sulfur and charcoal base. Very heavily on those two. That they can quite easily smell it. And, well, they wanted to get rid of the painting because it gave off a nasty, unholy aura. Shot an arrow into it. Uh, I think it was the Aerocrocra. The arrow disintegrated. That didn't work. Trying to bless it didn't work. So they came up with an idea of just unhooking it from its frame and rolling it up, using the canvas to basically not nullify itself and take it with them. With no leads, our characters uh, do not know where to hunt this cult. And it's not just one cult now that they discovered. It was multiple cults, multiple of varying factions. So they ask around the town, see if anyone has noticed any more activity beyond just the docks and the manor and maybe a sulfur smell in the woods or any locations that are probably dangerous by townsfolk standards. The guards at this town actually did say that they have a sulfury smell coming from northeast, northwest of uh, their town. 
and they took our adventurers to uh, said direction. They stopped at an end, a uh, fork in the road, a small little off trail, probably by deer and bear, and just said, this is as far as we go, you're gonna have to find the rest of it. And with our adventuring party, has actually decided to pick one direction and go with it. What they ended up finding was a ravine, this horrible sulfur smell coming out of it, and not only that, it's very foggy, or not foggy, smoky, like a low-hanging smoke down in the ravine. They could get down there, but they don't know how deep it is. So they pick a direction to see if they can try and safely get in the ravine. They went about a few hundred feet, uh, if they walked up to the ravine, left, and then started making their way down into this horrible, horrible smelling, dark, and foggy ravine. So, with our players finally in the ravine or crevasse, they make their way down, barely being able to see within 50 feet of themselves, if not at least 70. Once they have traveled a good hour or two down the ravine, it's already dark, everything is black, and they see embers here and there in this ravine. They're just, just coals, their stuff is burning as if this was a volcano, but there has been no reports of volcanoes here. So they keep traveling and traveling down the ravine to meet what could potentially be a guard station with two men there discussing stuff with them. Luckily for our players, they haven't been spotted yet since the two men are still discussing with each other. So they decided to dorn robes that they have found at the docks and decided it was a good idea to try and infiltrate as, well, cultists. And they successfully have just made their way through with our Ericrocra, or Ed's bald eagle character, doing his best to make sure his god's amulet is not seen, so he, for some reason putting his hand on his chest. Once they make it in, it everything starts to clear up for the party. And they see that this room is full to the brim with hundreds hundreds of members trying to even get on little rock ledges to even see this stone this evil maliceful hot stone in the middle burning with malice hate and entropy and they also even noticed by a good insight check and a perception check that there are 12 cults in this very room. And the room's a good 500 foot diameter, 250 foot radius room, with the epicenter being the big rock, this evil rock. And it looks like all the cult leaders are at least up front, but to make it even worse, behind most of the groups have these Powerful CR-20 monsters from a Baylor, a star spawn of Cthulhu, a Slade that is trying to turn into a copy of Yarnghul, and even Ultraloths. And there's even a, a, a daughter of Shabnagaroth in the back, and a Shaton, or aka a Demodan from Karsari. It's just many of these powerful beings just sitting in the back just waiting and patiently waiting mind you because the Baylor would have straight up murdered everyone but I think he knows what he wants and he wants it and he's letting his little cult do his bidding and the other two cults that they've noticed is one is a near dead cult with one of our characters, Justin, the Kanku, wearing the uh, the cloak of that cult. And along with that, there is another cult with some good, pretty decently uh, well characterized characters. 
with big horned masks and flames somewhat similar to the Baylor's cult, but different in style. So when the group got in their uh, robes, they all had their specific colors. Caleb's orc had red, Justin's had a red-black, along with Taylor with an another red-black. Ed got a purple, and Johnny had a green, all representing to what their cults that their robes belong to. So they kind of desi designed a plan that could potentially end this in their favor by having the cults get into uh, arguments, a fight, and probably have it all break out. Their plan was simple, but they needed to figure out how to get everyone fighting. So, what did come up as a thought is to get the Baylor up and rowdy, and have the Star Spawn and Cthulhu get up and rowdy with each other. Because, you know, intelligence over bronze kind of thought process. And they move through the crowds, undetected, just looking like members who just got in late. And Justin brought it upon himself to uh, have a written document, a fake document, saying that... Uh, I think it was something along the lines of intruders are spotted outside the area. Or something like that, or... Or... It was fake documents to saying something, something on uh, security or whatnot. And considering he was wearing the uh, red-black robes, he went to the three members, the three near-extinct members of their cult, which apparently is the cult of Thursdun, the god of entropy, or primordial of entropy who literally created the Abyss in the D&D universe, or multiverse. Once he made it there, he, with his character, goes, ORDERS! ORDERS! As the cult leader looks down, grabs the paper, looks at it, looks back at the uh, Kenku, and goes, BS, you're not in my cult. And the other two members apprehend him because a notice I said dead or extinct cult. These are the last three members of their cult because whatever happened to them here in uh, in my little universe, there's only three members left. And you know, you gotta get initiated in by the leader. <laughs> so one player was immediately apprehended and the, uh, the Amet, member, the chief, was like, mm, I'm gonna have to get this going, raises his arms and the whole, whole crowd, all the other cult members start chanting faster and more furiously to this rock, trying to get whatever energies out of it as soon as possible, since now they know that there are infiltrators here, but they don't know who to pick out. Everyone has noticed that Justin's Ker Kenku got caught, and they had to make actions very much quickly as possible. Johnny did his best to actually say that the Baylor is getting uppity and calling the Star Spawn various names and willing to duke him out for that energy and not let the Star Spawn get it. But that didn't really work on the Star Spawn since he was more <sighs> Baylor's get uppity all the time. I'll take him out whenever it is likely. Other side comes around with, uh, I think it was Caleb's, uh, orc trying to do the same with the Baylor, um, saying that it is most likely a wiser option to get the energy before the star spawn, but the, uh, Baylor's like, no, I'll take him on when we all get the energy and become deities. So the plan wasn't working as great as they intended. So they had one option left. Attack the cult leader who's doing the uh, seance. And yeah, didn't expect that from them. I was thinking a little more uh, tactical or something. So they straight up went with the plan of outright attacking the cult chief who is 
doing the seance right next to the big rock. They get into combat and uh, they were lucky none of them got hit. Javelins were thrown, blades were swung, and the cult leader of this this 11th, 12th cult that isn't Thursdoom fought back, but he had a flaming vorpal blade. And he missed his two swings. And when I say vorpal, I mean, you know that's bad news. So they silenced him, making sure he cannot continue the seance, but he used a anti-magic crystal that he broke on the ground just so he can give his last commands. And the great CR-20 beasts start making their way to the stone to try and take the energy. Except it didn't happen that way. The stone ate them. You know, like how, uh... You know, like how a toilet bowl just kind of has the water going down the funnel? Yeah, it's like that. Except watching these CR-20s turn to dust or just cosmic soup. The cult leader actually had a different plan to resurrect his god, which was in the form of that rock. Which that rock is a shard of that god. And his name is Amet. My personal D&D supervillain. As Amet is my personal uh, big bad evil guy, as you can see, he's a... Uh, he was originally a Baylor, But I'm not gonna go through lore details because that's too much. All you need to know is, he consumed the Omniverse, and he was defeated. He was known as the Great Entropy. That is all you need to know. Once our players saw this, and saw that a star spawn and all these other powerful beings just got, you know, slurped, they knew something was wrong. As the rock started growing arms, left and right from all over the body. Some of the arms are starting to try and shape a face and more arms are just coming out wielding fiery whips and blazing vorpal blades and even a wing protrude with magma filling in between the membranes. This was not an ordinary fight. Hell was breaking loose and every cult member within the building immediately decided to uh, try and evacuate, screaming at the top of their lungs, as the very creatures they summoned are basically no longer existing. <laughs> They've been removed from reality and eaten. So, second combat starts as soon as the flames erupt from the Shard of Amet, and it gave off an unholy Roar. So, when it came to our party members, everyone tried making sure that, you know, kill it till it's dead kind of deal. <laughs> and I made him broken. I mean, broken as in 3.5 CR40, CR50 levels of broken. I did my best to try and make something that they wouldn't be able to possibly win. Except there's one problem. I am a bad DM. <laughs> I was too nice with them. So nice that I made like the AC range 18 or 20 and I forgot in 5th edition that you stack stats to your like proficiency bonus just to hit better. I failed so hard on that, but it still gave him a good fight. They could not possibly still win. So they do their best using radiant and holy damage to do away this monster. And even Ed came up with an idea with his Aerocrocra, or I think it was Taylor, who stopped a crowd of cultists use like a holy spell like frenzy or something and just made a swarm of cultists attack the shard of a met doing everything in their power but that doesn't work because i made this this shard of a met broken whatever damage they did to him he was just like ooh free food nom 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 heal 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 they they were 
not having a good time with this monster. Because every 1d4 rounds, and that included the start of the combat, they had to roll a wisdom save. And it was to not go insane from the abyssal gibbering that this shard gave off. And let's be lucky they only got the shard. If they got a full, like, a met, like, mini me a met, it'd be worse. It'd be far worse. <laughs> it'd be like a Baylor who just decided to say, eat Kronos. Like, if you've seen the stat sheets from Kronos from, like, 3.5 or something, I'm not even, He was, like, a CR 55. Yeah, it's like that. But, good thing the they botched the, uh, the ceremony, the, the resurrection of the Shard. Because no one wants that. <laughs> and I think one of the players, I'm not sure who unrolled the uh, painting of the face of Amet and was like, hey, I could probably use this to banish it. Mm -mm. Once they threw the painting at the shard, um, the, f the hands that were making the face turned into a full-on face. The whole entire painting just slapped on the face of the shard and just whoosh! Yep, face. I have a face now. I'm even scarier. I'm gonna eat you all. Good night. So that didn't work, and they were doing everything in their power. I was literally trying to hint to them that there is cliff faces that are protruding from the walls of the ravine that actually slightly make it over the center of the room, meaning they had at least 480 feet to, you know, curve in. Like, like, a, like, the room is round. And they didn't, I tried telling him it, but they didn't listen. And so, Taylor, being a smart individual, thought, why not? Because I heard that there's a Tarrasque happening. Why not we have the Tarrasque eat the God Shard. And I literally just... Congratulations, you beat the game. <laughs> but how are you going to do that? You have to make a connection, and a lot of magic just went out the window because of this being's existence. Including gods not wanting to be in this general vicinity. So, everyone tried their best to figure a way to summon in the Tarrasque, and, and once the shard was getting out of the ground, Johnny actually cut off a foot. He cut off one of eight, nine feet of this abomination and was immediately met with a whipped tail, launching him at least a good 100, 150 feet. One direction. Doing a humongous amount of damage if not all his health. Ow. <laughs> and so, uh, whoever was given uh, spells to actually communicate with the other party members who were taking on the Tarrasque, they said, hey, make a portal. We need the Tarrasque. There's something worse than a Tarrasque here. And a few rounds later, trying to desperately not get eaten or just obliterated. Well, a portal opens and a Tarrasque comes through the gate, eating the shard. Or merely halting it. We cut off the session around here and uh, no one particularly died, so I rolled a uh, percentile. Anyone who went above it survived those who went below it died. And unluckily for our paladin rogue halfling, Johnny's character was eaten, and his health pool was added to the shard of Amet. And I cut off the uh, campaign there, the one-shot, because 
we were running out of time, and I was trying to do my best to make an epic fight between these level 5 paladin mid-maxers who just gotten too deep with their characters. They, they could not take this thing on. But it turned out to be really fun. They actually liked it. I showed them the stats and they were like, Jesus God, this thing's even worse than Cthulhu. I agree. It was probably one of my best, uh, best things I made out of this. It was a fun, fun campaign. And I, I really liked it. And it does provide a new stepping stones on how I do some of my campaigns with big bad evil guys or just scary campaigns in general. And I tend to find this one the most thrilling. So yeah, this is the end credits area, so I have to personally thank the uh, artist, the visual artist with all those beautiful scenery and whatnot. You guys gotta check them out. Th their names are at the bottom of uh, the bottom right corners of uh, each art piece if you find one specifically you like. And um, you can tell the ones I drew are are quite easy to figure out. And yeah, this is nothing comparative to like my last video where I actually I was capable of drawing everything like majority of it was everything was drawn by me and the swamp of stupid but this one it, I didn't have time to do so so I mean I did enjoy it it was it was a fun fun thing for me to do and I hope you guys enjoyed this this is something I wanted to do I even told my friends this would be an awesome video last year and I'm, I'm happy to probably sh have this shown to you guys so Go out and enjoy some Dungeon Dragons with friends and have stories like this. And, uh, have a good day.